Well, it is my joy to be with you again today and to be able to meet together in this service and to bring God's word to you, but also to bring the greetings of Carmel Evangelical Church to put the record right. Two weeks ago, I was preaching on the Isle of Wight, but we're on the mainland of Britain, uh, loosely speaking, the outer regions of Bournemouth, but where where Bournemouth joins the New Forest. People said when we moved there, I wouldn't need to come to Spain again, but I told them that wasn't right. I bring the greetings of the people there at Carmel today. John and Dinah have met some of them in their visit to us and others as well. And we pray for them as they're praying for us. And uh, a neighboring pastor is preaching there today in my absence. It's a joy to me. He's also my son as well from a neighboring church. We're going to begin this afternoon by turning to God's word in Luke's gospel, chapter 23. And at this point we'll read verses 33 to 46. Luke chapter 23, and we read from verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast locks. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the Son chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth unto the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the bell of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Amen. So may the Lord bless his word to us at this time. Over this past two or three weeks, as I have been praying and thinking of the word of God for this service here today, I had no idea at the point at which the Grove Seminary had reached yesterday, when we were able to think a little of the death of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ in some depth and some detail, seeing the fulfilment of prophecy, the depth that the Grove Seminar info, uh, uh, provides at that level. And so today in this preaching service we come to think more of these things, but maybe in a simpler way uh, as we turn to the Word of God. And we're going to think uh, these things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. Here in Luke 23 and verse 33 we read that then when they were come to the place which is called Calvary. The place which is called Calvary. And we're going to think a little while this afternoon of that place called Calvary. 
and we're going to think of that event that took place there those years ago, even the crucifixion of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this afternoon, whilst we could spend time thinking much of the narrative or the storyline, we're going to think of Christ's death and consider these sins in a simple way by the words which he spoke, those words that he spoke from the cross, those sayings which were uttered there when he poured out his soul unto death. And so we come to think of seven such words in total, words of forgiveness and pardon, compassion and anguish, suffering, victory, and committal. Forgiveness and pardon, compassion and anguish, a suffering, victory and committal. And we should come to these one by one. And we begin by thinking of that word of forgiveness which the Lord spoke upon the cross. Luke 23 and verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. All this followed on from the verse that we have already referred to, verse 33. We thought of the place which is called Calvary, and then we went on to read of the action. There they crucified him. And as the Lord Jesus Christ was there being crucified upon the cross, nailed to that cross, bearing shame and scoffing rude, Oh, suffering that crown of thorns upon his head. Oh, bearing the marks of the torture and the suffering that he received in the judgment halls of wicked men. Oh, as the Lord Jesus Christ, now to that cross is lifted up to die, he utters this prayer of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, he's thinking of those who were at the foot of the cross. He's thinking of his enemies. He's thinking of those who were putting him to death in a human way. And so he utters this prayer of forgiveness. And who does he address this prayer to? He says, Father, forgive them. He addresses this prayer to our Heavenly Father's God. And this was the Lord's prerogative. While he was here upon earth, he came under criticism because on occasions he forgave men their sin. And the religious leaders of that day, in their ignorance, they said that couldn't be so because only God could forgive sin. Little did they know that the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed and is indeed the Son of God, whilst he walked upon the face of the earth. And so the Lord utters this prayer of forgiveness. And we see also as he, part of his prayer, oh, there is reference to the ignorance of the people. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They know not what they do. Oh, those people who were there at the cross, following after all that was taking place, even those who were responsible uh, for Christ's death by crucifixion. Oh, the Lord, as he forgives them, he speaks of their ignorance. Oh, he speaks of the fact that they did not know what they were doing. And does not this point us to the sufficiency of the Saviour in his death upon the cross when he poured out his soul unto death? Oh, he made that sacrifice, and in that sacrifice is the forgiveness of sin. It's the sufficiency of the Saviour. And yet when the Lord utters these words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, does he not look into the future? Was he not looking to that point when we would be born in due season? And did he not take our sin upon himself and nailed it to the cross? 
This is not just a story this afternoon. This is something that is we must pay attention to. We must seek his forgiveness, his salvation, for he has uttered that prayer on our behalf, and he alone can forgive us of our sins. Next we come to a word of pardon, still in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. And here we read Luke 23 verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. These are words that were spoken to one of those two criminals that were crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 32 of the chapter, the verse before where we began reading, or oh, the scene is set that there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. Two thieves, two robbers who had been caught in their uh, terrible acts and they had to face the death penalty because of their deeds. And as we think of those two Criminals crucified there with the Lord Jesus Christ. One on the left hand, the other on the right hand. And the Lord dying on the central cross. Oh, what was the reaction of those two criminals? Oh, as we read or think of the passage that we read. In verse 39, one of them, which were hand, he turned on the Lord Jesus Christ in bitter and anguish. And he makes a statement, if thou be Christ, save thyself. Oh, he was thinking what might be in it for him, in the one who was dying on that central cross. But he wasn't really thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was only thinking about his own ends and what did he have to lose. And we can almost hear him completing the sentence, if thou be Christ, save thyself. And us, a sting in his voice. He was only concerned about himself that there might yet be some deliverance. But then we go on to read of the other one. Oh, the one who rebukes the first one who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing out that they were in the same condemnation. But whereas they were dying because of the deeds that they had done, that one on the central cross, even Jesus, had done nothing amiss. And so we see the way in which that dying thief turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in his dying hour, he cries unto the Lord, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Amen. And this leads to that glorious word of pardon from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. O oh, paradise, looking back to the creation, the Garden of Eden and all its perfection, but paradise looking forward to that time with eternity, when all the redeemed shall be with him forevermore. Oh, some, they debate this verse, do they not? Oh, as to the precise order of things. And if you want to know more, come to the next growth seminar. I won't be here, but there'll be the opportunity to think of perhaps some of these things. The Lord descending and ascending, and where he was between his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven says here at that time and it's sufficient for that dying thief today thou shalt be with me in paradise here we have the lord's pardon for the repentant thief and what do we think of that repentant thief oh he was about to die he was about to breathe his last he came to the lord and found forgiveness and salvation he didn't have time to uh, join a church. 
He didn't have time to be baptized. His life was at an end, but he repented of his sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ can assure him of a place in heaven. And what's more, the Lord says today there was no long period of purgatory. No thousands of prayers that have to be asked, answered before this man could go to heaven because he had received the pardon of the Lord. And that same pardon that was given to that dying thief is also given to guilty sinners who repent of their sin Amen. and turn unto him. Next we come to our Lord's word of compassion and now we must turn to John's Gospel chapter 19 and in verses 26 and 27 we read these words. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Here in these words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke in these verses, verses 26 and 27, the Lord shows his concern and his compassion for his mother. Oh, he looks down from the cross. And there at the foot of the cross he sees his mother, doubtless heartbroken and sorrowful. And it would be seen by now that Joseph, doubtless being older than Mary, had passed from this earthly scene. He was the carpenter of Nazareth when uh, Mary was but a young girl, so to speak. And if he passed from the earthly sea, who was going to care for the Lord's mother? Who was going to look out to her when she would be left upon her own? The Lord shows his compassion towards her, does he not? And in verse 26, the scene is said, there is Mary, and next to Mary there's that disciple whom Jesus loved. Oh, one of the close disciples of Jesus, but so humble, he rarely used his name. Just the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John would have said, oh, the one who loved the Lord as well. And he says to his mother, woman, behold thy son. And she point, he points her to John. And who would become the one to care for her? And following these words addressed to Mary, oh, we have the other words in verse 27, spoken now to John, the beloved disciple. Behold thy mother. And in love and compassion, the Lord hands his mother over to John to care for her and to look out for her the rest of her days. And what do we read at the end of verse 27? John doesn't hesitate. He doesn't have to go home and ask his wife and his family. He doesn't have to think, can we afford to do this or anything of that nature? We read that from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Oh, the love and compassion that the Lord Jesus Christ showed to his mother in his dying hour. And as we read way back in the book of Psalms, oh, Psalm 145 and verse 8. Oh, we read again of this compassion. Psalm 145 and verse 8. And here we read, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Or it's added to here, slow to anger and a great mercy as well. But the first part of the verse, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. We come next to a word of anguish that was spoken by the Lord upon the cross. 
And here we turn to Matthew 27 and verse 46. Matthew 27 and verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Oh, here we have an insight into our Saviour's soul at that time. Words that express the Lord's feeling of forsakenment there upon the cross. We see such a forsakenment, first of all, in a physical way. In verse 45, we read, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Oh, that would have been about from midday through to three o'clock in the afternoon. And we don't expect it to get dark at that time of the day, do we? Wherever we are in the world. Oh, sometimes there may be a cloud that comes over and brings up a rain that is so much needed in this place at this time. But it doesn't get particularly pitch black, does it? But the blackness, the darkness is referred to here. Oh, it was a darkness over all the earth, an utter darkness. You know, even when it's dark at night time, and if you get away from the built-up areas, your eyes adjust, and you can see shadows and things in the dark. But all oh, this darkness that came over all the earth when the Lord Jesus Christ was dying upon the cross, oh, it was pitch dark. Oh, there was nothing to be seen. It was physical, and for the Lord Jesus Christ, it was spiritual, and so he cries out in his own language, Eli, Eli, and we have the interpretation here, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Again, these words are addressed to the Father. Oh, who else could the Lord address them to? But even at this time, when the Lord was fulfilling the Father's will and pouring out his soul unto death, it had seemed to him as though God had given up upon him, and he had been forsaken. Oh, this was not the case. The darkness came over all the earth, and God had not forsaken his own. What is taking place here is the sacrifice that was made for the sin of the world. The sacrifice that was made for our sin. And God, oh, in his greatness, he could not bear to look upon sin. He hates sin. And he could not bear to look upon our Savior for that brief period, pouring out his soul unto death. Oh, such was the cost of our salvation to our Lord. Oh, that he had to endure that utter darkness, that he had to feel forsaken. We should never feel like that ourselves. We should never have to suffer in that way. But friends, sometimes life may get a bit difficult. Sometimes we may feel things are against us, and that's when the devil gets hold of us and seeks to tempt us. And we may feel that God is a long way off. And we may feel that we are forsaken. But we can know that that cannot happen to those who are know him as Lord and Savior. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Be it for the remaining years of the life on earth for the believer or eternity in heaven above. Oh, the anguish which our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ endured there upon the cross. And then this leads us on from the anguish that he knew of body and soul to think of the suffering that he endured. And he speaks concerning this. John chapter 19 and verse 28. And here we read in these words, 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst, I thirst. Oh, we thought of the anguish of the soul that our Lord went through. But now, following that, in the agony of the soul, there is physical, bodily suffering that the Lord is, speaks of here. And he does so in two words. Just the words, I thirst, I thirst. Oh, here he's showing his humanity, even as he's pouring out his soul unto death. Not uncommon for those who were crucified, but oh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. It showed that too he suffered there upon the cross in this way. But when does the Lord speak concerning his suffering? When does he cry out, I thirst? Well, we read here, John 19, verse 28. It says, after this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. It was not until the Lord had fulfilled all the prophecy, yeah. all the scripture concerning himself. It's not until his life is being drained from him that he thinks of himself. And to accomplish God's will, he cries, I thirst showing to us the depth of his suffering for us. You know, sometimes it's a real blessing to feel thirsty, is it not? I must confess, there's been times in the past when I would go all day without stopping to take a drink of water if there was much work to be done, and you suffer for it. You begin to feel lightheaded, and you can't concentrate on what you're doing. Oh, on a long term, we cannot go without feeling thirsty. We cannot go without having a glass of water, a cup of tea, or coffee, or whatever, uh, and that we might be preserved. Oh, in serious conditions, going about the uh, satisfying our thirst, it could lead to dehydration and even death. And so it is a blessing to know when we are thirsty. Physically, we can do something about it. But oh, it's far more important that we think of a spiritual thirst. Or oh, might we be a people who are hungering and thirsting after God. Mm -hmm. The one who bids us to come unto him and thirst of him. Oh, that verse in Isaiah 55 and the opening verses, is it not? Isaiah 55 and verse 1. How oh, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, come by wine and milk without money and without price. Oh, are we hungering and thirsting after the things of God today? Are we hungering and thirsting after our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ? For that's where such a spiritual thirst will be cleansed. And as we come thirsting after things of God, as we come hungering after him, all oh, that we might know in him forgiveness of sin as we confess our sin before him. Oh, how the Lord suffered on our behalf. How he had identified ourselves with him when he uttered, I thirst, speaking of the suffering that he endured on our behalf. And then we come to the six of these words or sayings spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ there upon the cross. And it's still in John chapter 19 and it's verse 30. John 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. It is finished. Oh, the word of victory. Three tremendous words are they not. 
Oh, they speak to us at the end of our Lord's earthly life, his purpose for coming to earth. Oh, he had accomplished the will of God in his death upon the cross, and now he, the victory is claimed. Oh, all that he came to earth to do in taking away the sin of the world and in bearing our sin. Atonement for sin had been made there in his death upon the cross. Atonement, the price of the needed to be paid for our sin, but we could never pay because none of us could have not sinned. It was only the Lord Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, who walked this earth and never sinned. And as such, he was the only one in his death and crucifixion who could pay the price of our sin. Oh, the atonement has been made, the price has been uh, paid on our behalf. And so it is then that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ cries out, It is finished. And at that precise moment, something quite fantastic happened in the temple there in Jerusalem. That great temple veil, that huge curtain that divided the outer courtyard from the inner sanctuary that the priests could only enter once a year uh, to seek atonement for sin. It tore in two from the top to the bottom. Oh, that temple curtain that had been put in place in the tabernacle in the wilderness that had remained through the history of the Old Testament. Now uh, there in the temple is torn in this way, torn from top to bottom, not the works of a man, showing to us that in Christ's death upon the cross, the way is open for us to come and confess our sin, not to a man, not to an earthly priest, but to come and confess our sin before the Lord Jesus Christ. The way is open for us to come to God in and through his Son, our Saviour. And when the Lord had spoken all these words upon the cross, there was yet one word remaining for him to speak. Oh, we read of it first in verse 30, that he bowed his head and gave up his, the ghost. And what do we read in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46? Luke 23 and verse 46, at that time we read, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This is the Lord's own committal, commending himself to God. It's the words of a dying Saviour, is it not? The only Saviour of the world. Words that the Lord Jesus Christ uttered on our behalf as he returned unto his Father in heaven. And this points us, does it not? We who by the grace of God know and love him, no sins forgiven and the assurance of heaven, that heaven is the believer's eternal dwelling place. Oh, that we too might be there with our God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Oh, the Lord commended himself into the Father's care and keeping. And so for a while this afternoon, we've been thinking of these words that the Lord spoke from the cross. And what's the purpose of all these sins? We began by thinking of Luke 23 and verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. We've been thinking of this place called Calvary. We've been thinking of the words of Jesus spoken from the cross. And how do we apply these things to us? 
not in this place this afternoon. In the things that we have been thinking of, we have witnessed anew the death of our Lord and Saviour, that cruel death of crucifixion. And this reminds me of some, some advice that I was given perhaps more years ago than I call to remember when I was a young preacher of the gospel. And I received these words from the lips of an elderly preacher in his 90s, too frail to preach publicly. And he said to me, preach the cross and preach it often. But he said, never preach the cross, leaving the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Never preach the cross without making mention of the resurrection. Oh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he rose again from the dead, never more to die. He's seated at the right hand of the Father on heaven, in heaven, and there he's pleading on our behalf. And scripture tells us that one day in the fullness of time, he's coming again to receive his own unto himself. Amen. Oh, will we be among that number? Oh, we just haven't been thinking of something I trust this afternoon that is interesting. Oh, may we seek to be in a right relationship with God, to know that it was for us. He suffered and died on our behalf. Let us seek him while he may be found. Let us call upon him while he is near. Let us forsake our sin and own him as our Lord and Savior our crucified Redeemer, and yet our Lord who reigns in us and who is our coming King. This is what Calvary means. And may we know these things to be true to us. May we be able to join in that victory this afternoon in those words, It is finished. Amen. Amen.